When the lights go down, my mic will come on. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Oh, was that too loud? Okay, it seems really loud to me. Um, as you know, this is our first uh, town hall since I've become the director. I apologize that it's taken six months to get this together, but um, it's taken a little while to get the, uh, get the job under my belt and feel comfortable in it. So um, I expect to have town halls at least once a month from here forward, but I'm going to kind of put that out to the group here later during the town hall and ask you what you would like to have. Um, I like an informal kind of a briefing or informal kind of a meeting where it's interactive. Today I will be giving you lots and lots of information, but I hope that you will feel free to ask questions. I understand that they have um, changed the uh, auditorium. There are mics in the ceilings, so when you want to speak, you should be picked up. I don't know where they are, but you should be picked up by a mic. We don't have to pass around microphones anymore. So. Um, <clears throat> There are several, several topics that I want to cover today, okay? Um, and as I said in the email that I sent out, well, it, uh, several emails that I sent out with the wrong date several times, I apologize for that too. Um, I, I'm really not going to have a lot of individual charts. Most of the stuff I'm going to talk, talk about, I have notes, and uh, this will be videotaped. You can always refer back to it. I understand for the folks at the help desk who couldn't actually come up, it's actually on TV or on a monitor down there for them to watch. We also will have it on DVD for those people who are on shift work, and if they want to look at it later, they certainly can, and I believe it's going to be put out on the Q drive. First thing I want to talk about are VSIP Veras and where we are with VSIP Veras. Um, <clears throat> I've heard a lot of questions that have come up through the, um, through the management chain uh, regarding that, so I'll tell you where we are. As you know, we had to, for this year, um, move down from 300 and, uh, we have to be down to 351 people by the end of the fiscal year. We started the year out 380 something, 377, whatever. And as you know, several emails have come out over the year and offered VSIP Veras to different groups. Um, some of those were downsizing VSIP Veras, some of those were restructuring VSIP Veras. Downsizing, you lose the position. Restructuring, <clears throat> you can, for example, lose a GS-13 position and then establish a GS-11 position or lose a GS-4 position and establish a GS-13. So um, that allows you to kind of restructure your workforce to better suit your needs going forward. <clears throat> the last offer that was made to the entire staff um, with an off the rolls of date of 30 September, we had nine authorizations that were available. And we'd pretty much targeted all the different groups that we wanted to um, restructure or downsize during the year. So we decided that since we had nine left, we would open it up to the entire staff and see if there was anybody who hadn't had an offer or who may have had an offer with an earlier off the rolls date and they just weren't ready to, couldn't go uh, until later. And so this would give everybody an opportunity to leave if they wanted to with the incentive. We had 17 associates who indicated interest in that. And so what I did when I got that um, the response back is I went back to headquarters and said, hey, we have 17 people who want to go, but I only have nine authorizations. And they gave us the extra eight um, authorizations. Now uh, we have found out that only 14 of the 17 probably will go. And you know, it's, it's not final until September 30th gets here. But so far, now that we've gone back and told everybody, okay, we got the authorizations and you're free to go, only 14 have um, expressed a real desire, you know, and, and are pretty firm in their plans. That means I have three left. I um, am not going to be here next week. I will be on vacation. But I've asked Daryl Gossett to ask personnel, what is the best methodology for us to ask the staff again for those last three? Do, you know, do we put it out to the entire staff again? Do we have employees raise their hand and say, hey, I've decided I want to go. So there will be more news coming on those last three that are remaining. Um, a lot of people wanted to know what took so long this time. You know, from the time that we put the, the last offer out, what took so long for us to actually send the letters out to the people and tell them that they were eligible or, or they could go. What happened is 
when we put out the last round of um, offers, somebody came back, and I don't know who it was, and questioned the actual regulation. The regulation says that you, can, that you have to have a waiver to offer an incentive to someone who's in a special pay category. The way that had been interpreted all through the entire year was people who are on pay retention. We don't have anybody on pay retention, and so everybody, including personnel, thought, that doesn't apply to us. Well, they went, personnel went back and read the reg again, and they're like, oh, yeah, I guess you could interpret that to be people who are in that 20 to 10 special pay category. So when, of the 17 people we had who expressed interest, I don't know, there were 8, 9, 10 of them in that 20 to 10 special pay category. So we had to, behind the scenes, go to headquarters, ask for waivers. We got the waivers granted, but that took about a month to get done. So that's why there was a delay. Everything is fine, um, and I guess going forward we will have to ask for waivers, but it's not really a problem getting the waiver signed because we were, are on a glide slope. We have to be to 351 this year. Next year we were supposed to be at 331, I want to say. Um, there's an easy justification for why we would let people go who are even in those um, special pay categories of the IT um, series. So that's what took so long. Um, and I will answer any questions regarding VSIP Vera at this time if y'all have any. Okay. Next topic. Yes, I'm sorry, Steve, I didn't see you. What's it look like for next year? Okay, <laughs> good question. Um, and that kind of leads right into budget constraints, <laughs> which is the next, um, the next topic. The official ruling is that we have to get down to, I'll say, 330-something by the end of next year. So one would think that we will probably offer VSIP Veras. I mean, that's been the tradition. There's no guarantee, all right? Um, but that's, we generally don't have enough, that would be an, a loss of another 20 people. We don't generally have 20 people who want to retire um, in a year. So you would think that chances are good we would offer a VSIP Vera. However, there is a, um, and that's officially where we are today. We have to be at 330 something. Um, there is a move afoot in the J8 community as well as in the rest of headquarters to say, why are we managing by FTEs, by the number of people we have on hand? Why don't we manage? Oh, wait a minute. I, are there any contractors in the room? Okay. Yeah. There should not be any contractors in the room. I'll have to ask you to leave. The question has come up, why are we managing um, by FTEs instead of by our budget? And th the reason that brought to mind about contractors is because right now, if I hire a contractor, for example, I might pay 100,000 bucks a year for them or $200,000 a year. But I can hire a government person for less than that. And so why are we, you know, what we've been doing for the past several years is we have to stay within 351 people, so I'm only allowed to have that many government people, and here I am paying 150,000 or whatever the number is, and it depends on the contractor's skill and how long they're going to be on staff and that kind of thing. Why am I paying more to have a contractor on staff to do work that's on my plate just so I can stay within this number? So, you know, we've been augmenting our um, organic staff. The, the look now, or the, the discussion now, because of the budget constraints, is why are we doing this? This is really stupid. Why don't we look at the total number of, uh, or the total budget that we have, and if we can hire more organic people for that total amount, then do that and quit worrying about FTE numbers. So, the ruling hasn't changed yet, but there's an awful lot of discussion on it. So, it may change. And if it changes, and they take away our glide slope um, numbers for next year, then I would say there won't be any VSIP Veras. In fact, if our budget allows, we might even hire some people. So that's the reason I'm saying that to you. So that next, you know, those three remaining VSIP Veras, I'm not trying to encourage anybody to go because the Lord knows we need every one of you. But 
if there's someone who's like mm, sitting on the fence and saying, I think I'll just wait till next year because there's probably going to be a visa at Vera, I wouldn't count on it. Okay, I mean, it's never a sure thing until you see the offer, but um, just so you know that there is that discussion going on, and so the, um, the winds may change here in the next year. Okay, does that answer, Steve? Okay. All right, budget constraints. The current budget constraints that we have, I know you all have heard about them from your first line managers, they were caused by gas prices, mostly for the agency. And I don't know, those of you who have worked in SAMS for years would understand this, but I know there's lots of people here who have nothing to do with SAMS. Um, we set our prices once a year for what we charge the services for things. And I believe that occurs in, is John Maley in here? No. no. Oh, okay. He would be able to answer this for me, but I believe that occurs in June or July every year. Um, and so when we set our prices, it's for the following. Is that true? Thanks, Cindy. <laughs> It's been too long since I've been down on those details, but um, whenever we set our prices, they are for the following year. And when we set our prices for this year, that was a year ago, and gas prices weren't where they are today. So we told the services, we'll sell you gas for a buck a gallon, and we're paying three bucks a gallon to actually provide it to them. So for every gallon we sell, we're losing two dollars. I mean, that's, that's the simple the simple answer. So that's why we're in the position that we are right now. However, I just heard on the um, J6 Telecon with May, yesterday, day before, that we have actually raised our prices on gas. I don't know if that's because it's June or if it's, um, I imagine that it is, but I didn't go into that detail with her. But anyway, so going forward, things are going to get better, but we've already lost a bunch of money. And that's why we're in the position that we are. There's one other way that we could um, recover that money and that would be by raising the cost recovery rate and that's basically the surcharge that is added on top you know if we sell a widget to the army we buy it from a vendor for a, a you know ten dollars and then we add a surcharge to that of five percent two percent whatever the number is and it varies and it pays for us and it pays for the people at the centers to do their work. You know, it's basically the cost of uh, goods sold or cost of doing business is added on top of whatever we sell, just like a, a retailer or any wholesaler would do. We could raise that cost recovery rate to make up the money we've lost on the gas sales, but Admiral Lippert has made a promise to all the services that we wouldn't do that. And so he is dead set we're going to keep that promise, and that is why we, and I understand that, I mean, he made a promise to the military services and he doesn't want to go back on that promise and so what we have done within the agency is try to figure out how can we save money okay what does that mean to you we, what it means is tuition assistance has been cut down it's not cut out um, we're only doing mandatory or mission essential travel and training um, <clears throat> We basically had to take a 25% cut from our fiscal year 05 budget in both travel and training. Right now, I have about $180,000 left for the rest of the fiscal year, which is roughly three and a half months for training. So there is still some money. Um, and we have people who are still taking some training classes. So it's not that we're totally out of money. I have about $200,000 in travel remaining for the next three and a half months. Um, so, and if you look at the number of people that we have, and just think about your travel vouchers, most of the times when I go TDY, even if it's just for, for a day or two, it's a thousand bucks by the time you do, you know, the hotel and the car rental and the um, airfare and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we have 350 people. $200,000 might sound like a lot of money, but it's really not. We're really being very careful about um, the travel that we do. It's not just us. Headquarters J6 is also being very careful. There, I'll just give you some examples. We used to have a um, yearly J6 um, <coughs> conference that was canceled this year. We used to have monthly CIO council and TIE technical um, information exchange meetings. Those are all being done by VTC or Telecon now. Instead of being a you know two-day meeting once a month, we're doing two or three hours of. Um, I can't see who just walked in, but that's not a contractor, right? No. <laughs> Did you say yes or no? Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. The lights are too dark back there. Um, 
anyway, so it's not just employees. Management at all levels are also cutting back. So um, we, we just need to be careful about how we spend our money. Um, Daryl Gossett and his staff are keeping close tabs on this. But that is why we are, are doing this, is so that we can stay within our budget. And then there are no other um, more draconian measures that have to be taken. Um, I will tell you that um, it, we're going to talk a lot about climate culture today. I put it on last on the agenda so we can spend the most time there. But one of the um, writing comments on climate culture was that they thought it was ridiculous that over time um, had to be approved by an SES. And, and I understand that comment. It is, um, it's a shame that the agency is in that position, but we are where we are. And <clears throat> I have been delegated approval authority for BSM, because that is considered mission critical, and just recently for the CERT, um, because they, they have to cover 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. plus weekends. And they don't have enough staff to do that, so every week we have 13 hours of overtime in order to do that. And after three or four times of me sending it up to Larry and saying, please approve this overtime, he said, you know, let's just stop this. This is crazy. They have to do it every week, so I'll just go ahead and delegate that authority to you. So um, it's not just overtime that's being looked at. It's everything. And it, it is true that it's too bad that an SES has to take a look at, you know, five or six hours of overtime. but. That is the financial state that we're in. It's not being done to micromanage. It's being done to try to keep the agency afloat. Okay. Um, oh, there is a brief to Admiral Lippert this Friday on all of the, um, there's been an awful lot of brainstorming done over the last few months on how can the agency save more money other than just cutting travel and training and overtime. Okay. They're looking at all programs. And when I say all programs, I mean CRM, PDMI, BSM, um, eWorkplace, uh, Enterprise Help Desk. I mean, everything that you have a program that is funded, every initiative in the agency is on the um, chopping block is not the right word, but it's being considered. And they're looking at how is it funded and what are the measures that we can take you know, can we put things on hold for a while, okay? For example, let me, I'll just tell you one of the ones they've discussed, no decisions have been made, but CRM, Customer Relationship Management, which is kind of a, a module that hangs off of BSM, and basically it's the interface between the um, users at the center and the military services to work um, their uh, requirements plans, if you will. Um, they're looking at, bless you, do they, um, do they just put it on hold? You know, it, it, it was just fielded, but there are supposed to be many more iterations and upgrades to it. Do we just let it sit where it is for right now, just let it run status quo, and then when the money situation gets better, then we start doing those upgrades? Those are the kinds of things that they're looking at doing. Um, but that briefing to the Admiral is this Friday, and there should be a decision shortly after that as to what programs will be um, uh, cut or delayed or um, shortened, whatever. So as soon as I hear that information, I will put that out to you all just to let you know what's going on. OK. Um, oh, while well, we're talking about the Admiral. Um, as you know, Admiral Lippert is retiring. Um, he is, uh, there was a big question whether the retirement was going to be 7 July or whether it was going to be 14 July. And I want to say because the Secretary of Defense, I don't know, Secretary of State, somebody, some big wheel, um, was thinking about, uh, <laughs> that's the technical term, was thinking about presiding or attending his uh, retirement. They have now decided it's going to be the 14th, so that tells me that whoever that person was is evidently going to be there. But more importantly to us, because I doubt that any of us will actually be at that ceremony, they have not announced his replacement yet. Um, so he will be retiring, and for a period of time, we don't know how long, General Reno will be, um, who is his, I mean, next in line, will be running the agency. Um, and as soon as I find out anything else about that, I will be sure to pass that along to you. Okay. Are there any questions about budget? Yes. Dean, is that? Yes, It's really hard to see you all in the back. More 
contractors come in. Can you explain why they can do that versus... Sure can. Okay. Yeah. I assume you're speaking of Accenture, since that's who you work with? Correct. Okay. Um, Accenture was paid one price to deliver BSM, and it's up to them how they spend that money. So they have the oper I mean, they do have certain headcounts that they have to keep here, but it, they are required to bring in um, people who have the skills. They also I, that's kind of a, a touchy subject, but they <laughs> I know. <laughs> Believe me, I know. They also do bring in some greenhorns and train them on the job. Okay, that's the only place they have to train them is in the field. They don't have a place to teach them how to do the job in the office. So there is, there's a certain number of greenhorns. We aren't going to discuss that just yet. Um, that'll be more in climate culture. But it's up to, um, in this case, Lance, how he wants to spend his whatever money he's been allocated. He can spend it on travel. He can spend it on training, or he could do none of that and have his people here every day. But every time they go to training, it doesn't cost us extra money. Okay, that, that bill does not directly come back to the government. They were given a budget, and they have to live within that budget. So it's up to him how he allocates that money. Does that help, Dean? Yeah, Susan, on that, is that, was that price fixed years ago, five yes. years ago? Or yes. Or it renewed every year? It's my understanding that it was a firm fixed price five years ago. Now, there are periodic payments that go. They got an extension through, set through December of this year that was supposed to be over in September. Okay, but requirements have been added, and Accenture got an extension through December of this year. They are looking at an extension through March of 07. Okay, but FOC is still technically and officially. Um, September. If they are extended through March, there will be another payment for that extra three months. But it's my understanding that the entire BSM contract was let for, I don't know, $750 million, whatever the number was, it's somewhere in that range. And through, as they, as they produce deliverables with their staff, then they have gotten periodic payments of that original amount. Okay. There was another question. Yes. Uh, consider, I've read that DLA is, and the U.S. Uh, Transportation Agency are guaranteed to buy, or thinking of buying. How would that affect our budget, and is that why the agency has selected a new command? Um, there has been discussion for the last couple of years about um, transportation taking over DLA, the transportation agency. As far as I know, that is not happening. Okay, there's nothing official, although there is a, um, there is a, uh, there was an, a letter that I saw, I don't know, three or four months ago that said they were going to have some kind of an oversight role, not over just DLA, and I, I believe that, e that letter may have gone out to the floor. If it didn't, I'll be happy to share it. It was very, very vague. But it said that they may have some oversight role with not just DLA, but many other agencies. So that's still way up at the 10,000 foot level. I don't think that has anything to do with our um, commander leaving. It's just time for him to retire. You know, he was extended an extra two years beyond the time that he wanted to leave. Um, I have not, uh, nobody has told me that. I, your guess is as good as mine on that, okay? You know, it takes, it takes an act of Congress to give us a new um, commander for the agency. So here's the, the sticker, or the, the sticky part of that. You know, Congress goes on vacation for the summer, or whatever they call it. Um, so if they don't figure out who it is pretty soon before they leave for the summer, then we're, it's going to be fall before we get a, new, a decision on a new commander. So, um, But I have had no information that says that's in any way tied to Transformation Agency, okay? Transportation, sorry, Transportation Agency. Any other questions? Yes? Oh, yes, my name is Yvonne Pennington. Uh, I have a question about the contractor. I know at least two contractors who know how you live in Ohio. Mm-hmm. One in Texas and one in California. How can they approve that, that they're working out of state? I mean, there's no way to check to see what they're doing. 
the same way that we approve you teleworking. One day a week. <laughs> yeah, um, but that's that's the theory. I know I know about the two contractors that you're talking about, and, and that happened before I was the director. And when I found out about it, my response was pretty much like yours: What? What are we doing with these people out here in you know Timbuktu? Why aren't they here in Columbus? And so. If there, are, if there are any difficulties, that person should be, of it, just like when, when we telework, we, it is supposed to be invisible to your customers and coworkers, whether you're here or not. You should be available and they should be available eight hours by email, email and or phone. So it should be no different than you emailing someone in the next cube or picking up the phone and talking to somebody in the next cube. Okay, occasionally they're going to be at the restroom or they might be out to lunch or whatever, but by and large you should be able to get a hold of them. If you are trying to get a hold of one of those contractors or any contractor and you can't, then you need to elevate that to your manager so they can take that to the COTAR. Okay, so if, if there's a specific problem, we need to solve that. Okay. Okay, again, if there are things that, I don't know, are you the one who tasks him to do things? I have had to call him, yeah. Okay, and I don't know, I'm sorry, but I don't know, Yvonne, who you work for. She works for me, Patrick Hurd. Okay. And um, we can talk about that offline. Okay. If there, are, if there are difficulties getting that contractor to do what you need to do, you need to take it to Patrick. He will either solve it directly with the contractor or with the COTAR over that contract. Okay, now let me, let me go back to how can we have someone in Texas and California. That didn't sit very well with me either. And when I delved into that, I said, when we wrote this contract, did we write it to be in California and in Texas? And the answer was no. And so what I directed our contracting staff to do was either have those people show up here in Columbus like they were supposed to, or else we were going to cut the amount of money that we're paying to them. And I believe that cutting the amount of money we're paying to them is what happened. Okay, but we will not repeat that one. All right. Um, it was already a done deal. And so I gave them a choice, either come to Columbus or else we're going to pay you less because you're not here where I can touch you and talk to you. Okay? Any other questions? Yes. Hello. Uh, is there a faster way to get supplies that are already on the board than we order on, you know, quarterly or monthly, like headphones and stuff that's already on the board without going through the scrutiny process? You know, we're, we're not talking about big box. Right now, no. <laughs> right. Right now, when I took over as director, one of the things that I wanted to do was see every purchase that was being made. And so I am approving every um, expenditure of funds. Then once I kind of got a feel for, you know, everything's pretty much working okay, then the budget crisis occurred and I'm required to <laughs> approve every expenditure. Once the budget crisis goes away, I expect to delegate some of that stuff back to the divisions. But right now, I'm not permitted to do that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Concerning tuition assistance, do you see any improvement? <coughs> Actually, I saw a draft, and it was just out for comment a draft policy that I believe J1 wants to put out in the near future, and I think it might start with FY07, which would be in September. Um, honestly, I can't recall <laughs> the specific details of that. I can't remember if it still had that $1,900 limit or not, but here's what I will do. Jean, I don't know where you are. I'm here. Would you please make me a note 
to pull out that draft document and I will um, send the highlights out to people just to let you know um, what they're thinking about doing, but you'll have to understand it's draft. It is not, um, uh, it's not policy yet, but this is what they're thinking about doing. But I'm sorry, I just can't recall the details. It was maybe a four or five page document that um, addressed tuition assistance. But the good thing is at least they're looking at it and trying to figure out what can we do to hit that balance. You know, you don't want to hamper the people who want to better themselves by, you know, taking college courses, but you also don't want to put the agency out of business <laughs> by spending all your money there. So they're trying to hit that middle of the road to, you know, make everybody equally unhappy, which is pretty much what a compromise does. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions on budget? Okay. A76, this is probably the worst topic I have to talk about today. But even though the, um, the news is not great, I think that you all will appreciate at least hearing it and understanding what's going on. So I hope you can take it in that, um, in that context. A76, what is it? It's basically called competitive sourcing. Um, the Office of Management and Budget Circular a76 is the instruction that establishes this policy and it actually was established in 1966 but the concept concept dates back to 1955 um, and it applies to all civilian and defense agencies there are several other acts that govern this process and one of the things that I will do this is just a broad brush here's what a76 is that's what we're going to do today what I will do for all of you is to make sure that there is um, general overview training on A76 so you understand what it is and more importantly what does it mean to you. Um, that will be coming in the next few months, all right? Um, but basically what this does, what is competitive sourcing? It compares the cost of an organic, this group, um, versus contractor performance of commercial activities. And that's a big term in A76. There are things that are called commercial activities. And you can equate that to, if you can look it up and hire someone to do it out of the yellow pages, it's probably a commercial activity, okay? Um, versus things that are inherently government, inherently governmental. Um, in other words, they're not available in the yellow pages. And let me give you an, an example. There are a few things that are entirely inherently governmental. Um, for example, um, if I was a per if I worked in an office where a government office where I purchased things, every bit of the uh, work that's done up to actually signing the document and obligating the government's money is a commercial activity. In other words, looking you know out on the commercial market and seeing what um, let's talk about headphones flow. If I want to buy, if I work in Daryl Gossett's office and I need to buy some headphones, then researching what headphones are available, how much they cost, putting together that proposal, all of those things really can be done by a contractor. The only thing that is inherently governmental is somebody's signature on that line that obligates the government's money. Okay, and so basically, how did this whole concept come, come about? It came about because the U.S. populace wanted to make sure that, or, or whoever's in government, and we are government, wanted to make sure that the American taxpayer is getting the best value for their money. And so there has been, over the years, this look at, is it cheaper for the government to do things using contractors, or is it cheaper for them to do things using their own staff? And periodically, and I don't have all the dates off the top of my head, but periodically, each agency has to go through this review. We, here in J6, and I'm not saying J6C, J6 has to go through this, um, I believe, I didn't write it down, um, I believe that it will be um, January of 2009, okay? Whenever and it's announced that there's going to be a study. It's, it's an A76 study that occurs. Um, whenever it's announced from that date forward, generally there is 12 months to complete the study. You can occasionally request an, a six-month extension, so it could go on for 18 months. There are teams that are put together, um, teams that try to put together an organization using all of us that's called the most 
efficient organization. And basically that is what the government, ta basically there's, there's a group that's set up that's separate from us. I mean, it might include some of us on that team, um, but there's a group that's set up, just like today whenever we um, uh, put out a co uh, request for proposal out on the street to contractors, if we want to hire some contractors, there's a group that evaluates all the different bids that come in. That's exactly what's done here. The government, or the most, you know, the most efficient organization, the proposed most efficient organization, is viewed as a contractor and they submit a proposal to this this group or this team as well as contractor XYZ and contractor ABC and then those are all evaluated and so we have an equal actually we have a little bit better shot of winning um, that contract if you will than what the contractors do there's a ruling that any if you have 10 or more FTEs which we do that any contract proposal has to come in at either 10% less or $10 million. And I think it's, I can't remember if it's whichever's greater, whichever's less, but we'll get to that in the training. Um, but so we have a little advantage there, not a great one, but a little advantage there because they don't, it, you know, something's already in place and working. It's, there's going to be a cost of switching over to a contractor. And so they figure that 10% is, you know, it's worth it to just keep the folks there. Um, now, what happens, first off, I need to tell you that so far, of all the A76s that DLA has done, they have um, won 50% of them, okay? Uh, so it's pretty much half and half. Um, there are groupings that will have to be determined, and that's why I made the point about J6 has to do this, and the decision about the groupings has not been made. And you know, in J6, there's um, J6 Columbus, there's one in Battle Creek, there's one in Philadelphia, one in Richmond, one in Dayton. No decision has been made whether J6C will be doing its own, and Battle Creek will be doing its own, and Philadelphia will be doing its own, or whether the agency might say, okay, we're going to do um, one for all organizations, uh, all those ones that I that I just um, named off, or are we going to do, let's say, one for BSM, which would be a lot of the Columbus staff, a lot, uh, or a, a handful of folks in Richmond now with PDMI, and 20, 30 people out of Philadelphia. They could group it that way. So no decisions have been made about how this is actually going to happen. But it is coming, it is public law, there is, there's nothing that we can do about it other than we can make sure that we put ourselves in the best position to actually win the competition. And so, you know, 2009 seems a long way away, but it's not. Um, managers, most of the um, leadership group, and as well as some of the um, uh, leadership group would be all the 14s here, and myself, um, as well as some of the branch chiefs have already attended that initial A76 training, which is that broad brush overview that just kind of, that's how I know what it is I'm telling you today, because I just went to class, I don't know, two, three weeks ago. But um, it's not too early to start that planning. In fact, we have already been asked, and this is, this is there's a FAIR Act. Let me see if I have it written down here. Yes. Um, Federal Activities Inventory Reform Act. Basically, and this has been a requirement since 66, once a year we have to look at every position and every task that we do here and say, is it inherently governmental or is it a commercial activity? By and large, most things that we do here are um, commercial activities. That has already been submitted for this year. We'll get an opportunity to revise it next year as well as the following year. And then that, the one from 2008 will be the one that is used in the actual competition. But that just defines the scope of who you know, what jobs will be considered for this competition. Now, um, so what, what you can expect in the near future, within the next few months, I will say, you know, you don't want to do training so far in advance that people forget it by time it actually gets here. So that broad brush overview training I would like to do by the end of this year so everybody just has a general understanding of what is A76. Then people who are in this room right now will be selected as we get closer and closer to that 2009 date, people will be selected to participate on those teams. 
um, I don't have the names of all of the teams, but some of them will be helping to put together that most efficient organization. Some of them will be placed on the teams to actually do the evaluation of the proposal. So, um, and there has to be a division between those two. You have to sign non-disclosure um, statements that says if you're on the most efficient organization team, let's say, you won't talk to the people on the other team. And it's the same thing that we do today with if we're you know, hiring a contractor. You don't go and talk to contractor XYZ and tell them stuff that, you would, that is not publicly available to another contractor because that would give them an unfair advantage. So it is coming. Um, it's uh, kind of like taxes. You, you have to do it. But we will make the best of it, and, and I feel confident that this group can win that most efficient organization. It's going to be a lot of work, but I think we're up to the challenge. So are there any questions that I can answer at this time? Kathy. Yeah, um, the most efficient organization, I want to make sure I understand, does that happen before January 2000? No. That, yeah, that is, if we are, um, if we win the competition, then we are named that. And so we will, um, we will not be contracted out. Oh, I did forget one other thing. If, well, I, I kind of don't even want to go down this path but, path, but if we would lose a competition and a contractor would come in to do our jobs, all of them or some of them, depending on how those groups are designed, um, a contractor normally when they come to the table, they don't have a staff of 350 people. Not many contractors do. And so if a contractor has to hire anybody to do the job that they just won the contract for, government people have the right of first refusal for those jobs. All right, now you have to um, put in a resume, of course, with the, contracting, uh, with the contract co company. You have to negotiate a salary. All right, and there's no, it's just like if, if you decided tomorrow to go try to get a job at IBM, there's no guarantee they're going to hire you, but at least we do have that right of first refusal. They have to offer those jobs to us first. So um, even if the most horrible thing in the world happens, um, at least there is a small silver lining there. Um, now, why is, do I, not only do we need to start planning now for it, but you as employees um, need to, I think you need to know that this is happening so that if there are things in your life you need to do to get ready for 2009 and the possibility that we could lose that competition, then you've got three years now to get that in place. So I am, I'm not trying to scare anybody here, but I, I'm, I'm a very, very lucky person because I'm not the sole breadwinner in my house. I have a husband who, you know, um, takes care of things like that for me. But I know there are a lot of people here who are sole breadwinners, and if you didn't have your job with the government, that would be a huge, huge problem for you. If I were in those shoes, I would much rather know it three years ahead of time than two months ahead of time. Okay, so that is why I am letting you know now this is coming. Um, we will do everything we can to, to be successful at this, um, but just in case, it's better to be forewarned. Yes? Who, who can tell us today what our options are from a personnel standpoint if we don't get it? Um, what I, thank you. You just like my um, right-hand man here. Um, I, I'm sorry I didn't put that on my note card, but one of the things that, that will happen as we go down this path is we will have personnel representatives come in here and they will be doing part of that training to let employees know what is the process. Should we not win, what happens? You go on the PPP, blah, you know, those kind of things and, and what actually are your options. So, Gene, if you would capture that for me, please, I will make sure that that is one of the first things that, we, you know, we'll do it in the near future for everybody, but then we will also do it again as we get closer, okay, just so everybody understands. I certainly am not a personnelist, so I can't answer all those questions, but there are many, many avenues um, that are available to employees, okay? The one, um, the only bad thing, I guess, is that because it includes all government agencies, moving to DFAS won't keep you safe, <laughs> okay, because they'll have to do it eventually, too, so it might, you know, if you could hop around to agencies right after they got done, then that would be really good, but, okay. Yes, Frank? Do you know what kind of time frames? I mean, if you said it's 
starts January 2009, mm -hmm. goes to January 2010. Right. And is, is that when the announcement's made, who wins the competition? And yes. And after the announcement, if we lose, do we keep our jobs until the contractor takes over? You know, I don't know that off the top of my head. I'm sure that was in our training class. Do any of you remember that? Who went to the training class? How long does it take to implement that? I can't remember, Frank, but that will be, we'll, we will provide that um, to you. Gene, if you would write that one down too, I will get a specific answer back to the crew on that, okay? Because I can probably look that up in my book. All right. Any other questions? Sandy? No. It's a periodic thing, and I don't have that, those charts off the top of my head. It happens to be our turn in 2009, but it could come around um, 10 years later. I, I don't know what the interval is, but again, that will be provided. I will get an answer to that one, too, how often it occurs. I mean, I've been in the government for 28 years. It's never occurred where I've worked so far, so I'm hoping it's like a 30-year cycle or something. But. <laughs> Glenn. Is the A76 in 2009 just for J6, or does it encompass J3 as well? No, J3 is also, um, I don't know what their announcement date is, but all of DLA is going through this. So the center people are going to the same, you know, center managers are going to the same kind of training we are. Uh, J3 at headquarters is, J8, everybody. Okay, DLA is being... Um, reviewed at this time. Yeah, because that would be, that's a perfect, um, if they weren't, <laughs> I'd be looking for a job at DSCC. No, just kidding. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, that wasn't so bad. Oh, here's the rest of my A76 notes. I knew I had more. Just seeing which ones I may have um, not covered. I had three pages of notes on this. This is great. Okay, I covered all of that. Next topic, BRAC. And it is now 10 till 10. Oh, I just found, I did find out that um, we thought we had a hard stop at 11, but we don't. Whoever had the room at 11 does not, they canceled, <laughs> um, which is wonderful. So if we want to go past 11, we can. Don't like panic or anything, it'll be up to you. <laughs> But I know you guys just love listening to me ramble on up here. We will take a break, however, okay? Um, I can't go much past an hour without taking a break. So if we decide to go on a little bit longer, then we'll take a break. Um, so, um, BRAC. BRAC really doesn't have a big effect on us. You know, it was all discussed months and months ago. But here's the bottom line. There's 150 people coming to the DSCC complex. They will belong to DFAS, and they are going to take over, they're going to take up residence in Building 10. Okay? That happens to be, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, we're, we're standing up this NOSC Network, Oper Network Operations Security Center. <laughs> um, and we were hoping to put it in Building 10, but we were um, outvoted, because I guess BRAC takes precedence over us. But we'll, we'll talk about where they're going to be eventually. Um, that has nothing to do with us other than there'll be more people trying to get in and out of the gate um, in the mornings and the afternoons, but we don't really support DFAS and their IT environment, so no impact there. 245 people are coming to DSCC. Um, my understanding is that at first it will be as is, where as, so where, as is, where is. So those people are in the services right now and they will be sitting at their desk in Timbuktu doing their job on their current systems, but eventually they're coming to DSCC. What impact would that be to us? We'll have 245 more people to support um, their PCs and um, their systems eventually. Um, and I understand that they are, this has to do with reparable items. So I don't know, you know, that's way down the road. Will reparable functionality be put into BSM or into other systems? Don't really know, but BRAC, by and large, doesn't have a lot of effect on us, but I at least wanted to touch on that in case anybody had any lingering concerns, questions about whether it does affect us. Are there any questions? Okay. All right, physical move. Um, 
you, I'm sure you all have heard that over the past couple years we've been thinking about moving people around. I'm talking about moving their offices, cubicles, whatever. Um, it, after transformation, once uh, uh, CSOC, the DSCCB crew, and DSIOS merged, we still have, we're not all seated together, okay? And we want to all sit and live together. Um, so we've been trying to figure out how is it that we can move people around on floors four, five, and six, which on, in pod C, which is kind of where the majority of folks are. Um, there really wasn't enough room there, and so we negotiated with DSCC to get the north side of um, floor three. Um, I want to say Dis, who was down there before? I can't remember. Was it Dissa who was down there? And on the uh, very northern corner, there's like a corner office that has glass doors. It's really, really pretty. But that's going to be the new, um, my new office in Bob Dunlap's as well. <laughs> I'm the director. Um, anyway, so <laughs> Anyway, so <laughs> it's, I read, um, who's that guy, How to Win Fla Friends and Influence, uh, Stephen Covey? Yeah, people, yeah. Um, anyway, so Bob and I are going to move down there, and we were really hoping to get some really cool, neat furniture, but the budget has stopped that, so um, we aren't going to be able to do that. There were some cubicles, actually, in that, in that suite, which to me was kind of a waste of it, but um, we are going to move the furniture that we currently have, which doesn't cost anything, down there, so it won't be exactly beautiful, although, I mean, my furniture is great, Bob's isn't. Um, <clears throat> and the cubicles that were in there are going to be reconfigured to backfill our offices. Those large offices that we have, you know, throughout floors three, four, five, and six are going to be for the 14s. And then next, supervisors, we will make sure all supervisors have an office. After that, we are going to make sure that PMs have an office. And after that, if there are any left, then we are going to look at other GS-13s who need an office because of the type of work that they do. Um, uh, on an as-needed basis, by mission. And I'm sure eventually, at some point there, we're going to run out. So we will use some equitable way of deciding if we have eight offices left and we have 13, that's wrong number, we have 10 um, GS-13s who because of their mission really ought to have an office, then we'll use something, something like service comp date. Okay, so when we get down to that level, we will um, do an equitable distribution of offices. Now, um, if you've been on the north side of the third floor, you'll notice that the cubicles there appear smaller than the cubicles that we have. Here's the reason why. The little stand-up um, lockers that are in most of your cubicles are not in those cubicles. So the, the actual floor space that they take up is a little bit less, and the lockers sit like outside the, the cubicle door or along the hall or whatever. Um, whenever we saw that, what we wanted to do was buy all new cubicle furniture so that we could, you know, have everybody here be in standard configurations. The budget has stopped us from doing that, at least temporarily. We have um, checked with the union, and the cubicles as they are configured um, still meet the required square footage. Um, but it's, we really don't like that arrangement, so what we decide, the union is okay with, um, I mean, we could put four people in those cubes, but what we decided would be a better thing to do is maybe put two or three people in those cubes and leave one kind of open so there's a little bit of extra space in there, people aren't quite so crowded. That's our stopgap measure until we get some more money. If slash when that happens, then we will buy more cubicle furniture and make those configured exactly the way as, as everybody else's are. Um, but I didn't want you, I wanted you to understand that the budget is, uh, the, is what's driving this and that managers are also going to um, suffer a little bit of the budget crisis because we are, um, we're not buying any new furniture for ourselves either at this time. Um, I'm sorry, did somebody have a comment? <laughs> well, I heard you're going to be leaving soon, so you'll be out of the basement. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Um, 
Oh, and who's going to go into the, the third floor? Um, the CM group, the business office, is going to um, go into the third floor in those cubicles. And then from there, that will free up some space. And from there, we will then be able to move people into where they were and whatever space is freed up. So it's going to be kind of like a domino um, or, che or che checkers. Uh, <laughs> don't know why I can't speak. Um, but we will be, we're finally going to move out on that. In fact, I'm waiting for the final cost from um, DES so that we can start moving down to the third floor. I expect that to happen within the next few weeks. Yes? I might have missed it, but in this move, are you going to seg segregate the government employees from the contractors? I don't think so. I think we're leaving that up to each of the teams, well, the division chiefs and their team leads on how that should best work. Do you have a preference on that? Well, it's easier for working with them on a daily basis to be sitting with them. That's what we anticipated doing, is mixing them right in. OK? Right. Any other questions on the move? OK, it's um, five minutes till 10. Are you guys want to keep going? Do you need a break? Break? OK. Let's come back at five after. <coughs> Take your seats, please. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started again. Um, we probably will run by past 11, but I understand that the CERT has an engagement that they need to go to. One of their employees is leaving, so they will not be able to go past 11. But um, if the rest of you can bear it, we probably will, because we still have a lot to get through. Um, NOSC establishment, Network Operations Security Center, basically was um, it's required by the JTFGNO, who are out of STRATCOM. Joint Task Force for Global Network Operations. And basically, they say that every service, every agency, every COCOM has to have a NOSC. What is a NOSC? It's a, it's a marriage of what our CERT currently does and our NEMO does with some expanded um, responsibilities for situational awareness, um, application monitoring, reporting, those types of things. So we have to um, establish one. Right now, we claim that we have one, a de facto one, which is basically just a marriage of the CERT and the NEMO. What we really need to do is structurally, not just physically, put those two together, add about 20 more people to that group, but also um, organizationally, we need to do that. Um, at the same time, as you all know, SAMS is going to be retiring soon um, as BSM hits full operational capability. I believe the last items go into BSM October, November this year. Um, and so at that time, SAMS will, in fact, not be retired, but it will still run just in a, um, a historical mode until contracts close out receipts close out, financial records close out, and it actually, we're going to um, put a lot of the data onto something like the DSD, the Decision so Support Database, will basically just keep files there for archival um, requirements. I think for FMS requisitions, you have to keep them around for seven years, and there's a few other things, documents that have to be around for two years, so it will be rolled off to, um, or the files will be rolled off to a database so that people can retrieve data from it. But why do I even bring that up as far as establishing the NOSC? 
to establish the NOSC and to change our organization, we're going to have to have a general order issued. Um, then whenever SAMS goes away, there's no more need for that division, the CS division, that supports SAMS. Please don't think there's no more need for the people, because there are. We have plenty of work to go around. Um, but there's no need to keep that division that supports SAMS. So instead of doing a general order to stand up a NOSC on the 1st of October and then three months later doing another general order and disrupting our organization twice, we decided to do it at the same time. So what I want to show to you now is the organizational structure that we're going to use. Okay. Um, <clears throat> how do we get to this organization? And I'll, I'll go down through this and discuss it with you in just a second, but I want to give you a little background. Um, the leadership group came up with five different alternatives of how do we structure things in order to stand up this NOSC. I presented those to Larry Wilson, my boss, uh, two weeks ago. And this happened to be my favorite one. And luckily, it's the one that he chose and that he liked too. So um, that made it pretty simple. This is the one we're going to go with. Um, I'm, I, I'm at the top of this. Uh, we are going to, Bob Dunlap, as you know, is the director, or the deputy, he's not the director, he's the deputy right now. Um, he's going to be the deputy over everything except for the NOSC, if you will. And we have a military gentleman coming in, Lieutenant Colonel Terry. He's an O5, thank you. <laughs> I always think it's the opposite way. He's an O5 who will be coming in, and he has network and NOSC background. He arrives on July 14th, and he will be the deputy over the NOSC. <clears throat> okay. Um, as you see, there's no CS on here. All right. What are we doing with all the people in CS? Um, and this kind of goes back to, let me just go to, uh, let's see if I can go backwards. Yeah, employees supporting legacy systems. That was a write-in comment on the climate culture survey, and so I wanted to, it was an easy one to answer. I wanted to make sure I answered it here. What's going to happen to the people who are in CS? Basically, those people will be dispersed between the BSM solutions group as well as the NOSC, because as I just told you, we're going to have to add 20, 23 people to that CERT and NEMO in order to accomplish that expanded mission. Um, there may be a couple of people out of CS that go into CI or CO, but basically that will be done based on mission requirements, those people's skills and abilities, whatever. Now, our goal is to stand up the NOSC on 1 October. We have a project officer, Bruce um, Jarvis, who has been working to, to do that. Um, he's been working with Jeff uh, Roth and Sharon Sauls, who are the current chiefs of the um, uh, CERT and the NEMO. Um, and so we will be putting together that general order. In the general order, you have to designate what all of these branches are. You don't have to designate what people are in each of the branches. So we're already starting to write up that general order because it has to go through um, personnel, make sure that we are structured correctly, and you know, do you have 13s reporting to 14s and 12s reporting to 13s and all those kinds of things. Um, it also has to go through the union. I have already briefed this at the division level, down to the division level, to the union, and they are in concert with this. They won't give a formal um, opinion until we actually give them a document and set, that says how the organization is going to be structured. Um, <clears throat> we came up with the branch structures uh, over the last week with the leadership group, and then today's Thursday. This afternoon, not only the leadership group, but all the current branch supervisors are going to come to a meeting at 1 o'clock, and we're going to put names and faces to each one of these. Most people, okay, are not going to be, um, they will not change at all. For example, uh, people who are in CBR, in the business requirements group, um, most of them won't change. The only people that um, I do know that might change is back end. Then this is really getting down into BSM stuff. I'm sorry for those of you who are, don't work on BSM. Back end support for BW is going to be done completely in Philadelphia. We have a few, a couple of people who actually have been doing some um, support of that, and so we will be moving them around and finding other things for them to do that are meaningful, needed, match their skills, or for, for which they can be trained. 
but I want to, the point of this is I want to let everybody know that every person in this organization, even if you were in CS supporting a legacy system, will have a job. We're not getting rid of anybody, and we will do our best to match your skills and your abilities with your new job. Training will be provided. We've are, even though we're under a budget crunch, we've already gone back to headquarters in our NOSC budget submission and said, listen, we're going to need some major training bucks to bring everybody, not just that new service desk up to speed, but everybody in the CERT and the NEMO because this is a, it's a um, more complex mission than what we've had in the past. So let me just walk down through this. Um, CB is BSM Solutions. That's pretty much the same as what we have today. The big difference here is that we took, um, uh, for those of you who have looked at the current org chart, project managers used to be in the division level, if you will. They were a branch within the division. We've broken that out to its own branch. Same people are going to be in it. And um, we're going to have the integration group, which is going to include the, Claire, I might need your help on this. It's going to include the ICANN folks, as well as the DIBS pay CCF folks. True? Okay. And some of the people out of CS. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, is that where the trackers are going to go? Right. Okay, the folks who are in um, CS right now, Sherry Shiplett's group, some of those are, you know, right now what they do is operational support for SAMs. Well, they would be really great and probably have no problem at all transitioning to operational support for BSM. And so that's the match we're going to make, make there. So some of the CS folks are going to go there. I don't know who yet. We're going to figure that out this afternoon, OK? Um, <clears throat> CI, infrastructure. Um, we have basically, when J, J6C was stood up, we thought that there were a couple of groups under the infrastructure, uh, a couple of branches un under infrastructure that really were operational, after we um, executed that way for a while, that really were operational and vice versa. Some of the branches under operations really were infrastructure. And so we kind of flip-flopped some of those here. So um, environmental software, I believe that was already under CI. Um, Sue Ellen, help me if I say something incorrectly here. Um, project planning, again, that was up at the division level. That is now going to be its own branch. Um, basically, that just makes the division um, job just a little bit easier because then that lowers the amount of people they have directly reporting to them. Um, configuration management also includes release management here. And I don't know if that was its own branch before. I don't believe that it was, right? Is there, can you help me with what else will be in that group? That's it, configuration release management. And then innovation <laughs> development, which is, whose group is that today? Is that um, CSI? OK. All right. OK. All right. Thank you. Um, operations, the help desk is still going to be under operations like they were before. <laughs> um, environment management, I believe that's currently one of the organizations. IA operations, that's Patrick Hurd's group. Unix and Windows. Um, oh, and we, we did want to point out this office symbol, J6Cal. We assume <laughs> that everybody, in, we thought that to you know, like help people embrace that particular office symbol, we would get everybody those gateway shirts so they can all wear those together. Um, actually, this is what we're going forward with, but if anybody does have a really a real problem with that office symbol. If they can think of something better, that's great. You can submit it through your management chain. But um, OU stands for Unix, and W is for Windows, so it kind of makes sense. Just like uh, CBD, it used to be CBE for engineering. We decided to make it D for development, R for requirements, P for project planning. So they kind of make logical sense. So that's how we came up with the cow. Um, <laughs> let's. <laughs> Let's talk about the NOSC, OK? Basically, this is the CERT as it sits today. However, we changed the names a little bit. And I think a couple people who were in the operations branch are going to the assessment branch, right? Um, we're adding a new group. And I'll talk about that in just a second. And this is the current NEMO, OK? 
this service desk is going to service both of those groups and they're going to be a 24 by 7 help desk uh, and it's beyond just a help desk where you answer the phone and write out write out a ticket it's not a level one I guess and I guess it is a level one right but it has expanded um, responsibilities the people who man that help desk will actually be network experts who can do a lot of the troubleshooting um, and a lot of the analysis that's going to be required in that group. Uh, one of the things that today is in Sue Ellen's group is Topaz or BAC monitoring, application monitoring for the user um, response times. That is going to go over to the um, NOSC service desk and it will be expanded, therefore take more people to do it. So the people who do that today will end up being in that service desk. Um, there are I'm not going to go down into great detail about exactly what reporting chains they have to do, but they'll have to do info spots and they, there are these different matrix, matrices of how you have to report and what the incident is and if the system can be down during certain periods or if it is down during certain periods of time, how many users are impacted, can it be down like from midnight to six without any user impact, all that type of data is being gathered right now to stand up this NOSC so that they will be able to do that reporting that they're required. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about one other thing here while we're on the NOSC establishment. Um, there's something called the Enterprise Help Desk that's coming. And again, this is I'm throwing this out here as um, not a warning, but as information for you as we're planning um, or as you're planning what you will be doing in your careers. The Enterprise Help Desk is a, um, uh, it, there's a contract that is being led. I don't believe it's been let yet, and I won't say anything about the contract because it's all, um, not classified, but um, contractually sensitive at this point in time. But the goal of the agency is to have a contractor who provides day-to-day -day desktop support for the agency. All right? Um, will there be any organic people doing it? don't know because we don't know exactly what's going to happen in that contract but the goal is that the agency would um, contract that out right now they have that at, at the headquarters but as contracts you know right now our help desk is a combination of contractors and um, organic people um, and this is another reason why I wouldn't necessarily want contractors in the room today um, <clears throat> Tomorrow, it will probably be more contractors, and so what do we do with those organic people? Well, um, when slash if that comes to Columbus, and I cannot tell you when that will be. It could be in three months, it could be in three years, or if the budget stays the way it is, it may never happen. But if it happens, what we will probably do with the folks who are in this branch right here that do that kind, and, and it's going to be, um, I believe they're also going to do the same thing that your folks do, do the asset management and those kind of things. That will be done by a contracting group and of course there will be a period of time where we'll have to transition it to them, whatever. But once our folks are out of that business, then what do we do with them? We'll do the exact same thing with them that we're doing with the CS folks. We will probably just have that branch there but nobody in it. And the folks who have been on the help desk and have done that tier one and tier two um, support for desk, for desk side support today already have the skills to work right here, okay? And we know that hopefully what will happen is as the mission in the, um, the help desk for your lap, or laptops and PCs goes down, the mission for the NOSC raises and so it's a smooth transition to move those people over. Um, and it can be done all at once or it can be done on a, you know, a, on a gradual basis, whatever. So we will work that. But the point I want to get across to you today is that as we make these shifts in our organization, nobody's going to be out of a job. Everybody will have something to do that is meaningful, that matches their skills and or as, as best we can, and or they'll be retrained to do whatever the new job is. So rest assured, everything will be just fine. Um, uh, there was one other point I was going to make, and it escapes me now. Hold on, let me look at my notes again. Maybe it'll come back to me. Oh, um, I 
something did come back to me. Somebody came up to me during the break and asked a question about, back to VSIT Vera, whether I could tell you who was on the VSIT Vera list. I cannot do that. That is a personal um, employee uh, informational kind of thing, falls under Privacy Act. The, every employee who is leaving on VSIT Vera has been notified. If they choose to tell you, that's their business, but I cannot share that information with you, nor can the supervisor. So um, somebody said there was a lot of questions going around about that. So that's why I didn't give you the names. Um, that's, you know, some people want to retire and they don't want anybody to know until the day they leave and they say goodbye just like they were leaving and um, no one sees them again. And that's perfectly fine. In fact, that's probably what I'll do when I retire. <laughs> I, not that I'm leaving anytime soon, but, um, well, I hope not, but after last night's conference call, it might be sooner than you think. Um, <clears throat> but I'm just, uh, some people just don't like that whole fanfare and people, you know, making over them and all that kind of stuff. So that's really not something that we can share with you. So um, you'll just, I guess the gossip and the rumor mill will just have to keep mulling that one over. Okay. Um, are there any questions about, oh, there is one other thing. You'll notice that um, there aren't enough boxes on here, division boxes, for all of our 14s to have a, um, an office, uh, not an office, physical office, but a, a division. We're, we already have a deputy in CB. We're going to have a deputy in CI and a deputy in um, CO also. Okay, And then, of course, we have the new um, equal to a 14, the 05, who's in charge of the NOSC. And we will have, um, there will be... Um, I can tell you this, it's not like it's any big secret. Big secret. Sharon Sauls is going to go right there. Jeff Roth, I know that's a big surprise since those are their current organizations. Um, Sue Ellen's going to have operations. Dewey's going to have infrastructure. And Harriet will have CB with Claire under her. We haven't quite yet determined who the deputies are going to be in these two boxes, but that will be coming. Okay. Are there any questions about the new organization? I would expect lots of questions on this one. Yes, Erin. Um, on the NOS service desk, since mm -hmm. there's no branches under there, is that a 14? No, it's a thir I'm sorry, it's a 13. I skipped right over that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Sandy. Not the whole briefing. Is this chart going to be immediately available? Yes. I can't see it. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, I can send it out on email. Okay. Or actually, I think. We'll put it on the Q drive, okay. okay, so that everybody will have it, okay. all right? Include it, it will be the whole briefing. There's only four charts. I don't like charts. <laughs> I would rather just talk off the cuff. Yes, Steve. Susan, what's COM, Environment Management? Sue Ellen? <laughs> oh, it's IWS support. Um, IWS Phil support. Donovan's group, okay. I'm sorry? As opposed to end user. End user is the help desk itself. But okay, even if we even if Enterprise Help Desk comes along and they take the call, they still have to give the work to somebody who can actually fix it. Um, and this would be like your tier two folks. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Scott? Yeah. Uh, for the people that are transitioning to new areas, when does that transition start? Does it start now or that was the other point. Thank you so much. Um, how are we going to keep SAMS alive when we stand up this new organization, right? Our goal is to stand this up on 1 October, okay? Um, we might do a, is it called, no, OpCon before then, but I don't know. But we want to have it in place, everybody in their seats, doing the new job by 1 October. However, if you are, a, if you are someone who's going to be placed in one of these new organizations, you know, one of these you're going to be placed in an organization that's new to you. Your first mission will still be what you do today. And that will be a considered a residual duty, OK, until that mission goes away. Now, if I am, a, let's say I am a functional analyst on SAMS, which is what I used to be, OK, today I might only have 30 hours of work a week. I don't know. I haven't gotten down in those details. But let's say I only have 30 hours of work a week to do. That other 10 hours, I can start learning my new job. I can start you know, sitting with the people. I can start reading the regs. I can start taking some training, whatever. So it will, for that each person, it will be a gradual switch over until their old job or duties 
are eliminated completely. But if I am on SAMS and my job today has taken me 50 hours a week to do or 40 hours a week, then I won't be doing anything on my new job. Even though I will be on, a, on an organizational chart that says I report to Sam Smith, okay, I still will be reporting to my current supervisor doing my current job. Okay, so thank you so much. That was an, an important point, the residual duty thing, okay? Is that clear to everybody? Yes? Mm-hmm. Not yet. We might know after 1 o'clock today. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. All right, back to the agenda. Climate culture. Okay. Um, I can't remember. I think I have an actual chart on climate culture. I do. Okay, climate culture. Our 2000, I hope that you all had an opportunity to see the climate culture survey results. What was sent out to you by email the first time that Bob sent out and said was on the Q drive were the actual results themselves. Um, when we sent that link out, I didn't realize that the write-in comments were not attached to that. And when I figured that out, because uh, Jeff couldn't find them, um, then I sent those out just in the last couple of days. I assure you that was just an oversight that was not intended to not let you see those write-in comments. And, and the reason I want to point that out is two years ago, whenever um, the climate culture survey came out, those um, writing comments were, we didn't get, we as management didn't get them and were not allowed to send them out or they were not made public. And so I want you to know, in fact, when I was on um, the call with May yesterday, uh, she said, there is nothing secret about climate culture. This is, an, this is something that management and employees need to work on together and, you know, it's open kimono. So um, I even, I think, gave you an, uh, suggestion on if you want to see everything that had J6C in it, just do a find on J6C and you would find those comments. And actually, if we have time, I have printed out some of those and I'm going to try to address a few of those, the ones that are um, easily answered, I guess. Um, the 2006 results were worse than 2004, which is um, disappointing, but basically that just means we have a challenge. And I know you guys can't see this, but this is a little chart that I hope you've looked at. You want to have more and more colors in here. You want to have these little things filled out. This is 2004, and we basically had the center circle plus one little quadrant filled up. 2006, we just had the center circle filled up, and the numbers that make up those little circles were less. So um, it, it's, it's not as good as we would have liked, but it gives us plenty of room for improvement. Now. Um, DLA uses something called the SMART plan in order to put our arms around exactly what we're going to do. And the SMART plan is just basically the first letter of each of those. It has to be specific. In other words, we have, I have to come up with a, I'm tasked to come up with a SMART plan that says exactly what is it I'm going to do to make the climate culture better here in J6C. Okay. Um, it has to be measurable. In other words, you have to be able to say, did it occur or did it not occur? And it, or is it, you know, if you're looking on a scale of 1 to 10, we were at 1, now we're at 8. So it's measurable. Um, aligned, it has to be congruent with DLA goals and vision. Reachable, it has to be realistic and challenging. There is no way in one year that I'm going to fix every problem that was brought up on the climate culture. So what um, DLA has said is pick two to three um, items in the climate area and one to two items in the culture, or I may have that backwards, whatever. Anyway, pick a handful of things and focus on those and get those better. Then you continue to keep those at status quo and then you go on to the next thing. Because if we try to fix everything at once, nothing will get better. So that's what we're going to do. And it also has to be time bound. There has to be deadlines. So there, in this plan, we will have to say that by 30th of July, we will have this in place. 
um, so that there are measurable results and we can say, yes, we actually did this. Um, we need to determine those focus areas, the two to three um, in climate and culture that um, uh, we need to work on. And there will be lots more coming on this, but that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you all about, is um, what exactly would you like to do? You know, it's, I've been tasked, that's, it's part of my, that's what I'll be rated on, is how the climate culture he is here in Columbus. And so there are several different ways we can do that. This could be a management initiative um, where we try to figure out based on the comments that were, you know, the, the answers to the questions and the comments that were written in, what the areas are that need to be focused on. And we could try to work on that ourselves. This could be um, a management and employee um, initiative where certain employees help us. Um, we could have every two weeks, we could have a forum like this where everybody gets together and we discuss what the next steps are. So I'm kind of looking to you all for um, how would you like to do this? Um, you don't have to speak up now. If you feel comfortable doing that, that's great. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, you can always speak with your supervisor who will send it to your division chief and will send it to me. Um, but we kind of, you know, if we want to just brainstorm some ideas about how we would do this, you know, a couple of years ago when, in 2004, when the climate culture came out, survey came out, we developed a sensing team and each division had a representative, I want to say, or a couple of representatives who were on a sensing team. If you like that idea, that's fine. If you feel like the sensing team um, spoke for your organization, uh, we could do something like that. We could have one person per branch who is on a group, but I will, I know I'm going to be on the team. How many management people, well, all the um, 14s will have to be on it, and it still remains to be seen how many of the um, branch chiefs will be on that team, but whatever comes out of that, all of management will have to make sure they comply with it. Um, so I guess I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Does anybody have any great ideas, you know, um, about how you would like to see climate culture improved or how you would like to see us move down putting this smart plan together. Susan? Yes. My first thought on it is if you're only going to do a handful of items, work on a handful of items, that all of us somehow be involved in the process of identifying those handful. I think that's a great idea. Does, do the rest of you, by show of hands, did you hear what Steve said? Okay. What he said is that if we are only going to work on a handful of items, then we as a group need to decide what those items are. So what is most important to you, all right? Um, so by show of hands, tell me if you agree that that is the first step and the right way to go. Okay, that's good. Then we have a consensus on that. What we will do is we will um, put together, uh, I'll put out some type of an email to the entire crew and we'll figure out how to collect those results. I can't do that here on the fly, but um, we will give everybody an opportunity to put in their top items, however many that is, and let's say top five now, but who knows what it'll be when I send the email out, but we will let, let everybody vote on what they think the top issues are in this organization. We'll gather them all together, and what, you know, whichever ones get the top votes, then that's what we will focus on, all right? Um, yes, Kent? Oh, yes. And I'm wondering how many things managers at, at Columbus level are being blamed for things that were really directed at headquarters. Um, yes, headquarters in, is involved. In fact, when we discussed this on the J6 teleconference, this, I mean, we spent hours discussing climate culture, and not only is J6 involved at the headquarters, and they're making a smart plan, and they're doing, you know, they have all those same writing comments, and anything that was... Um, directed at them, they have to resolve or address. So is Battle Creek, so is Philly, so is Richmond. We are all, everybody in the agency is doing this. And not just J6, but all of the agency. It just seems like unless some things are corrected at the very highest level, mm -hmm. almost nothing we do at our level, or anything we do can be countermanded by their actions taken later. Unless they're done in concert, it might be a useless endeavor. 
Well, I can tell you this. I can tell you that J6, Made Even Sent Us, is committed to making the Climate Culture Survey better, not just for her headquarters organization, but for um, all of the field sites. And if I bring up, or if we as a group bring up to them something that, hey, listen, what you're doing in this particular area is having a terrible effect on our people. And if you're serious about climate culture improving, we need you to change this. We can certainly send things that way, okay? And if they are not willing to do it, and then we get bad scores or, you know, bad results in that area, it'll be, pff, told you so. We already told you how to fix it. So um, we, we certainly can address those, Kent. Yes, I'm sorry, but I can't see who's back there. Hi. Uh, did you say personally you hate social contracts? No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and from the supervisor's perspective, it is a useful tool. To, um, um, actually, Bob... But it's another administrative burden that you'd get. Right. That's placed on the right. right. Um, actually, Bob had sent to me um, some an email that I still have in my inbox. I've read it, but haven't really taken any action on it, that did just that exact thing and said, here is what DSCC has done with their climate culture. Maybe we need to look at some of these things. So I would be happy to do that and to present those at, like in a next forum to the group and let everybody look at, do you like these ideas or do you not like these ideas? Um, we could certainly do that if um, people are interested in that. Would, by show of hands, would you all be interested in seeing what DSCC did? DSCC did to improve their climate culture? About half of you. So we can throw it out there and uh, let people um, look at it. Jean, would you capture that, please? Is she still here? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, Lisa. Um, in the study, wasn't there already some things that were identified for J6C that needed improvement? In the study. From that. Oh, yeah. The, well, basically every area that there were questions on need improvement. And so what we need to do, there are, um, there are 12 major areas, but within there, there were many, many questions. And so... So aren't we reinventing the wheel by asking people to give us more ideas? Why don't we take that? It's not more ideas. It's of those, which ones do you think are most important to focus on first? Yes, yeah, I'm not going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to send out what was, what was identified as a problem, and then you all will have to say, I think this is number one, this is number two, number three, <coughs> all right, and then we will, we will add up those scores, but no, we're, we have enough problems, we don't need to, like, invent more. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? All right, so the takeaway from this is I will send something out that, um, categorizes all of the issues that were brought up in climate culture and you all will have an opportunity to vote on what you think are the top five let's say I think that's a good good number to start with and then from there we will get we will then schedule our next um, town hall focused on climate culture um, and, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute on the next slide um, we will schedule our next meeting to talk about um, climate culture and figure out how we're going to put together a team to spearhead this. How many employees want to be on the team, what we think the right number is, which managers are going to be on the team, that kind of thing. Okay? Any other questions before we move off of climate culture? Oh, I do want to, there were a couple things. I promised this. Um, I told you that some of the open-ended comments, I, I printed out all the ones that were directed at J6C. Um, and I said I would address some of those that were a little bit easier to address. This is one of the comments. The single most important thing J6C could do to improve would be to recognize that not everyone in this organization is on the BSM uh, team. We have no idea what the future holds for our current positions or for our organization. 
Once BSM reaches FOC, what happens to all of our um, jobs? And I think that I have answered that question by talking about the people who support legacy and that they will be retooled to go either to the no overall to the NOSC or to um, BSM. So, um, and then have the chart on the NOSC org chart. So I hope that that, I don't know who put that question in, but I hope that that addresses that. Um, another writing comment, communication from, and this is the single most important thing uh, that we could do to improve things, communication from the J6C director to J6C employees, monthly town hall meetings to let workers know what is currently happening. This is the first one. Up till now I have um, communicated with you by email. Um, and I will continue to do that as, you know, important things come up that I think I need to communicate directly to you. But, actually, let's go to the next chart, because I think it's on future town halls. Okay, how often do y'all want to have them? All right, whoever wrote this in, one person at least, thinks they need to be monthly. I think that's the minimum that we need to have. I would be willing to do them every two weeks, um, but I don't want them to be so often that they keep you from doing your work and we don't have anything to talk about. All right, so I'm kind of just throwing that out there. You guys can think about it. We'll I'll poll you in just a few minutes about that. Okay, I also want to talk while we're on that, the whole town hall thing. Do you guys like this kind of a, you know, informal? To me, this is somewhat informal. But we don't have canned briefings on every single topic. Or, you know, and some people like that and they like to take their own notes and they like to hear what I have to say. We could go more formal. It's more work, which is why I don't like it. Um, but we could go to more formal briefings because then you do have a document that you could take back, you know, and look at later. Do I really think that happens? I don't normally do it, but some people like that. So I would entertain that if people would like more formal type presentations. I can tell you that if we go to that, a lot more people than just me are going to be up here talking. Um, leadership group. <laughs> okay. Um, also, you know, today was our first, our first town hall, and I brought forth what I thought, based on comments from climate culture, questions that come to me every now and again, hallway conversations, what I thought might be burning issues for you. I don't know if I hit the mark or not, but I hope I did. One topic that I was going to talk about and decided against it was BSM after FOC. The reason I decided against it is because there's a, a huge number of you that have nothing to do with BSM and so it would be boring to you. We also, when I first became the director, had a BSM forum. It wasn't called a town hall, but we had that subject and went over it within the last couple of months so I didn't want to go over that again. Um, so my question to you is how would you like to um, pick, do you want me to always pick what we're going to talk about at town hall? Or do you all want to be able to send things uh, to some mailbox that says, this is what I want you to talk about? Yes, Steve? I don't mind if you pick them, but if you're open to entertaining additional ones during the meeting. OK, that's fine. Yeah, because there are some things that I need to let you, like A76. <laughs> some of you may have known that was you know, in the uh, coming up. Some of you may not, but I feel like you need to know that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's fine. So we can work we can figure out how you're going to communicate those types of things. I don't know if we put in a, a mailbox and you can send your topics or your questions or whatever. And that, um, you know, I, I'll be happy to entertain questions here. Do you like doing it just um, impromptu like that or do you want to submit your questions beforehand? Um, the, you know, if you submit them beforehand, then I have a chance to prepare. If you do them right here, I will tell you the answer if I know, and if I don't, I'll get back with you on it. And I guarantee you, I will get back with you on it. Um, <clears throat> I, we do need to discuss climate culture. Now, whether we have that in a town hall or whether we have climate culture forums, doesn't matter to me, but we do have to do that. I, I really think we need to do that on a periodic, recurring basis, because as we move down this SMART plan, I need to know, and, and whether what we're doing is helping at all. Because I don't want to get to the end of this year and do another survey and find out that all the time and effort we spent didn't hit the mark. So I want to make sure that, you know, I want feedback on a regular basis from you like, this is really stupid, Susan. It's not helping at all. It's making it worse. Or we really, really like that. Let's do more of that. Okay? Um, again, it, employee's choice, management's choice, or both. Steve kind of threw out there he liked both. 
Um, before we address all those questions, and we're going to be done like almost right at 11. This is so good. Um, and I didn't even practice this. Um, before we come, you know, vote on those kinds of things, I want to address a few more things that came out of the, um, that came out of the climate um, culture. The director, needs, the director needs to be more approachable, not require appointments to see her. She also needs to focus on true priorities. Inspecting the work areas for neatness should not be one of them. I want to put this to bed one final time. <laughs> Okay? <laughs> I never said I was going to inspect areas for neatness. You can have all the pictures of your family that you want as long as they're not naked. Okay? <laughs> you can have little doodads. You can have statues. You can have flowers. You can have whatever you want on your desk. What I did was, before I became the director, I was on the bomb search team. And I was crawling around on my hands and knees searching for this fake bomb. And by the way, I found it. Um, and I know that the person who found the bomb in the last exercise got an on-the-spot award, I believe, for that. I didn't get any award. Um, so if someone wants, wants to write me up now, they can. Um, although I think the time period has passed. But we were, as we were doing the bomb search, there were boxes and boxes of old manuals and junk that were sitting underneath the people's cubicles. And in order for us to do the bomb search correctly, we had to open each box, look through the contents, and then, close, you know, then we put a piece of tape on it and said, that one's searched. Then we went to the next one. And it took us a long, long time to go through just a few cubicles because of these boxes of stuff that were under their desk. So I saw that as a danger to employees. If we ever really had a bomb, that's a perfect place to hide it. And the potential for it to go off before the bomb search team can actually get through all these hundreds of boxes of junk on the floor. It, it, I mean, it, it really is. And so I saw this as a safety issue. That's why I had a meeting, and one of the first things I did, the first meeting I had with um, the leadership group was I explained this to them and said, please ask your people to get their boxes off the floor, and I will be coming, just so that, you know, just like on the SMART plan, you've got to have a deadline, and it's got to be measurable. So that I know what happened, I'm going to be walking around and making sure that all the boxes are really gone. Why did I do that? I didn't actually ever walk around. Um, right after that safety inspection happened, so I just asked the safety monitors to tell me. And there was only one box left, so that's really, really good. But I knew that if I didn't set a deadline, that it wouldn't happen. You know, it's like too hard to do later. I'll get to that eventually. So I said in two weeks, I'm going to walk around and look and make sure all the boxes are off because I am concerned about the safety of the employees here. It was never intended to say that you can't have your personal effects at your desk. My goodness, that makes your life easier and better. I keep a picture of my ki kids in my daytimer because that's why I'm here. Okay, got to put them through college. Um, so I, I want to put that to rest. I, I never was going to come around and inspect for cleanliness or clutter or whatever. Um, now, the part about... So I, I hope we are now in understanding on that one. Um, the part about not requiring appointments to see me, I can't change that one. My day is booked from um, 8.30 every day till at least 5. And you can ask my division chiefs when they need to come and see me. If it's an emergency, they're free to walk in my office. If it's not and it can wait, they make uh, appointments with me. And that is because I would never, I, there's just not enough time in the day. And I cannot have 350 people walking into my office to talk to me. But, but moreover, not just my time. Let's say that, Michelle, you have something that is just really bothering you, and you come in and talk to me about it. My first question to you is going to be, did you talk to your boss? No. Uh, well, you really should try to solve any problems that you have with your immediate supervisor. If the immediate supervisor can't solve it for you, then they have an obligation to take it to their division chief, and they need to try to solve the problem. If the division chief can't solve it, the division chief is supposed to bring it to me, and I will try to solve it for you. But if employees walk in directly to my office, you don't allow your supervisors to have an opportunity to try to help you and to do their job. And in essence, then, I should just supervise everybody directly. 
because the people that are being paid to manage and to guide the day-to-day -day operations here are not being given an opportunity. And that is moreover the reason than just my time. There just isn't enough time in the day um, for me to let everybody walk in the office um, unannounced. Um, you need to let the management chain work the way it's supposed to. Now, having said that, if there is, ev and this has been a policy for years around here, if you take a problem to your supervisor and they don't give you what you believe is a satisfactory resolution to it, then you are to tell that supervisor, I don't like what you told me, and I would like to speak to the division chief. The supervisor then briefs the division chief and says, okay, this is what I discussed with Michelle and I really just can't help her. It's out of my, as Kent you know, talked about a few minutes ago, it's out of my um, authority zone to even resolve this. Then the division chief has a meeting, or you know, the branch chief will schedule a meeting with the employee at the, with the division chief. They try to resolve it. If the employee is still not happy and still doesn't feel that it's resolved, they have the right to say, I want to talk to the director. Then the division chief will brief me on what's gone on before so I have some background, and then the, they will make an appointment with me and the, and the employee, and I will try to resolve it. Okay, so you do have the opportunity to speak to me, um, about business matters. Now, of course, I always like to just talk to you guys, the people that I know on a personal basis that I have, you know, worked with over the years. I like to ask how your kids are doing, all that kind of stuff. I'm not saying you can't talk to me about those kind of things. I mean, I, we, I do that every day, just like I'm sure you guys do. But um, I just do not, I just cannot satisfy whoever wrote that in. Um, I'm sorry, but I have to say no on that one, which will probably make our climate culture survey go in the in the uh, gutter for next year. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes? Good, a question on that. How about if you have a positive, you think you have a good idea that will help the organization, mm -hmm. you take it to your supervisor. He or she doesn't think, is there any way of verifying that it went up through the chain to you for your evaluation? <clears throat> well, you can ask your supervisor. Okay, and if they, well then, if, then that's the case I just described. If your supervisor says, I don't think it's a good idea, then you say, well, I think it is, and I want to talk to the division chief about it. Okay? All right. Yes? I guess if I, if I was an employee and I sent, an, I sent my supervisor a problem, I would expect an answer within a day or two. And if there's a supervisor who's being non-responsive, then after a couple of days, I would take that to division chief and say, listen, you know, even here's, here's the way I do business. If I get an email from my boss and I know I can't answer it today, I mean, first off, I read every email in my box every day, and I think everybody should make that attempt. When I'm on leave, do I? No. Okay, but when I'm here in the office, I read my emails every day. And if, I, if somebody sends me something, and I know I can't get them an answer, can't solve it that day, I still send them an, an acknowledgement back and say, listen, got your email. It's going to take me till the end of the week to get you an answer, but I just want you to know I haven't, I'm not ignoring you. And I think that's the way all of our managers and employees should work, so that you're not, you don't feel like you're just sending something into a dark hole. So if you have, I would give them one follow-up, and say, listen, I sent this to you three days ago. Haven't heard anything from you. Are you there? You know, did you hear what I said? Or, you know, something keeping you from answering me, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Is that fair? Any other questions on that? All right. Um, this is on to the um, most wonderful thing that we could do, or the best thing we could do to, a uh, single thing we could do to make uh, life better around here. To bring back our legacy systems and let government personnel do the work <laughs> that they've been doing for the past 30 years. <laughs> Regardless whether we want that to happen or not, I do not believe that is going to happen. We need to just accept the fact that BSM is here with all of its warts and we will be responsible for maintaining it. And what we need to, to focus on now is 
making that system as good as what our legacy system was. And I think our legacy systems were absolutely marvelous. Um, and it's going to take a few years to get there, but we can do it. But there's, that is something that, that's at the, um, at the DOD level. DLA has gone to DOD. They've made a case to modernize. All of the military services are going to ERP. So it, I'm sorry, but that is something that really will not change. Um, Susan? Yes. I didn't write that one. But <laughs> I, that, I can't answer that. Um, that's a J4 question. They're the ones who actually interface with the services. I would suggest that you go out to the BSM website because I bet you there is some data out there about that. Um, I know that there have been some problems, specific problems, interfacing with some of the service systems and we have um, worked those specific problems. But as far as general feedback, don't know. Um, I do know that the Navy has asked that we help them implement ERP, you know, that we show them our lesson learned, lessons learned, give them some guidance, do, you know, those kinds of things to help them as they move down this path. So um, I think overall in the DOD, DLA is viewed as a success in implementing its ERP. We're the first out of the gate and we're the first who are actually almost at the finish line here. So, okay. Um, by bringing in contractors to bring DLA up to the 21st century application-wise, we've neglected our workforce and let it deplete itself to a state where government workforce can no longer be a productive entity within DLA. Um, I don't really know how to respond to that one, so I'm just going to let that one alone. Um, with no room for personal growth within the organization, there's a difficulty in bringing in, in and keeping younger employees. We have just recently hired six interns. And the in, you know they're for a few years within DLA. There really wasn't a, a huge um, focus on interns, but we just got six people in. And my understanding, ten. ten. Okay, thank you. Um, we will be getting more as the years <coughs> progress. We have to do that because most of us in this room, well, not me, but most of us are nearing retirement age, and so we've got to bring some young folks in here uh, and teach them how to do the work that we're doing because eventually most of us will want to retire at some point. Um, so I'm glad to see that the, uh, that the intern program is alive and well and within the entire agency, not just in J6, but within the entire agency. Um, and it, it goes on to say, once they realize there's very little room for career development and that an A76 study is underway within J6E, they take their education and move to a more beneficial employment opportunity. Um, I I may be wrong on this, but I'm not aware of any of our younger employees moving off to other organizations. Maybe I am not informed on that. Maybe this happened before I became the director, but we do everything within our, in our power. You know, even with A76, I think the government is a great place to work. In fact, um, we've had a lot of contractors who have expressed interest <laughs> that they would like to come to work for us in lieu of working for a contractor because with a contract, you know, it's, it's a finite period of time. Let's talk about BSM. When FOC gets here, there's going to be a contractor who will supplement our workforce, but it will not be the same arrangement we have with Accenture. Um, and so those people who work for Accenture are kind of like, mm, am I go is Accenture going to win the post-FOC contract? Don't know. Will it be SAIC, IBM, XYZ, ABC? Don't really know. And so those people are just like us. They have families. They have mortgages and car payments and all that. They're all looking at, mm, geez, that FOC is coming up here and our contract's going to be up. So what am I going to do then? And so a lot of them are seeing that working or saying and feeling that working for the government is probably a better opportunity because it is a more stable, although not guaranteed, it is a more stable um, working condition. Oh, and by the way, somebody asked a question earlier about how often does A76 come around? Sue Ellen gets the prize today. She remembered from the class it's every five years. Okay. <laughs> Are they clapping because Jeff is leaving? <laughs> okay. Um, the last comment Although the, uh, the uh, goodbye cert people, 
uh, and, I, and I'm almost done here. Um, it says, hire managers, not technicians, to manage the business. That has long been a, a problem in, in the IT environment, as well as at the centers. People who are great at doing the work that they do are the ones who tend to get promoted, and not everybody is a great manager, even though they may be a wonderful technician. And so what the um, DLA has recognized that, and I brought a little paper with me. I won't be able to find it now, but basically um, DLA is requiring, and this is as of a result of the 2004 climate culture survey that talked about the fact that a lot of our supervisors are not really good managers, and so DLA now has a requirement that 20 hours of leadership training per year per supervisor be um, accomplished. And if you don't accomplish that, you cannot get an exceptional rating in your resource management on your um, supervisor's camp get an exceptional rating um, under resource management for their performance appraisal. So they have um, recognized that that's a problem. They are requiring all managers to go to this at least 20 hours of training. And several of our folks went to um, executive leadership development program training uh, for a whole week, a couple weeks ago. I had to cancel out of it because of crises uh, with planning and BSM. but. And I was very disappointed, although I'm going in October, and, and my immediate staff tells me I definitely need to go, um, to become a kinder, gentler person. Um, but <laughs> you can get an acceptable, but you can't get exceptional. Okay, And that means you probably can't get an award. <laughs> okay, um, I mean, it, it's, that's not a given, but you, know, you have to have certain, uh, you have to have exceptionals in so many, you have to be above average in so many of your... Um, critical elements in order to qualify for an award. Anyway, my feedback from that, um, from the managers who did go, that was that it was an exceptional class and really did give them some of the skills that the culture has been saying for a while that we've been lacking. So hopefully that will only get better as time goes on. Okay. Yes, actually, that's one of these write in comments. Okay, yes. Okay. Um, senior J6 leadership needs to spend time personally meeting each employee assigned under them. And I'm going to, um, and I want to address that. One of the write ins was that I should have, oh, here we go. Most J6C associates expected a meet and greet for the first floor visit from the new site director, not the morale busting desk ins inspection, to single out those with work areas deemed cluttered or messy. Okay, um, I didn't come around and meet and greet each of you, and, and for those of you who expected that, I apologize. Um, I didn't really think that anybody would care to meet me. <laughs> um, but so I, I will make that better today because at the end of this session, I know many of you because we've worked together for almost 30 years. But for those of you who have never met me personally, if you will stay afterwards, I will make a point to shake your hand, introduce myself, and tell you a little bit about me personally. You can tell me a little bit about about yourselves personally, so that um, we I, I will rectify that today. Um, so that was the first sentence in this, in this other comment. Employees should be able to act without having to go through four layers of management to get a decision. Local decisions such as overtime and awards should not have to be approved at the J6 SES level. I believe I've addressed both of those um, in previous uh, uh, conversations during this town hall. First line supervisors should be able to act and make decisions without fear of reprisal. True. Uh, monetary awards, ha this is to your question, monetary awards have basically been discontinued since J6C was developed. Before the merger, DSCC recognized and awarded performers in a timely manner. J6 seems not to value the skills and talent of the employees. There needs to be more awards and the first line supervisor should not have to have SES approval to act. When I read that, I asked Daryl to get me some, some statistics so that I could either see is it true or is it not true. Um, in 2005, the entire year of 2005, we, did, we awarded 422 awards. For a staff of 350, I think that's a pretty good number. Um, because of the, not just the budget crisis, I can't even tell you exactly why, but 
the only awards that I have the authority to sign are um, on the spots. Everything else has to go to my boss at headquarters. Um, and I send them up there on a regular basis. You know, after we do performance appraisals, um, which I believe for employees the ending period is December 31st, so those normally get done in January, February, then about March we do all of the awards that were based on the previous years. So we generally send up a really big spreadsheet at that point in time to headquarters. That has already been done for this year, and those awards have all been given out. Those are in the, the well, sorry, that was last year's. Um, but anything other than an on-the-spot, I have to get approved.